Hey, how's it going? In honor of the upcoming Pokemon Go Community Day this weekend, I felt that it would be fun to jump back into Generation 2 and just give Hop up a chance. Not only that, we're going to be doing this on Pokemon Crystal, and I'm pretty excited about it. I could give you all the stats and analysis in the world, but it just all comes down to one thing. Hop up is really bad, and we're going to see that soon enough. So if you're a fan of the channel, and I don't know why you'd be watching this if you aren't, you might know that I've done a Lugia video about 9 months ago, and a common comment and maybe even a criticism about that video is that I did didn't do the post game content after the Elite Four and I'm here to proclaim today that we aren't stopping until we beat Red. I'm willing to suffer for the greater good guys. And speaking of suffering, I do Pokemon solo run content fairly often so if that is of interest to you, consider subscribing to keep up with the videos. Comments and likes help break into that dreaded YouTube algorithm and if you're someone who just generally never comments, just scroll down and type in cat face and if you're wondering why that's the comment this week, it's because Jumpluff kind of has a cat face and that's what we're going to name it. Just Despite Hop Up not really having that phase, just throw the image up. With that said, grab yourself two Sodi Pops because this might be a long one. Sit back, relax, and let's follow Hop Up's journey to getting 16 badges and just becoming the very best like no one ever was. As we begin this arduous journey, I pick my Hoppip and I name it Catface because of Jump Love like I just said. I don't reset for IVs, but instead I use a save editor because everyone is going to be getting a shiny Hoppip this weekend that includes me. Fun fact, shinies in Generation 2 are actually based on IVs, which means that I decided that this ugly shiny with inferior stats kind of outweighed the benefits of actually having a good Pokemon and having an easier time. Cool. And now let's get to the fun part. Astute observers might have noticed Hoppip's moveset. It has Synthesis, which restores varying amounts of HP, Tail Whip, which lowers the opponent's defense, and Splash, the worst move in the entire game usually reserved for Pokemon like Magikarp. And you see the problem here? I cannot damage opposing Pokemon, and that's really not what you want to see when you're sitting down for a nice, casual, relaxing solo run in your off time. This is going to lead to the most tedious and time-consuming processes to start off a Pokemon game that I've had to do so far, and let's just get through it. First off, I have 75 power points of worthless moves that I have to get rid of, but the first roadblock is that you just can't do it against any Pokemon. The Pidgeys and the Centrits of the world will just wipe you out long before you reach that point, so you will need to search for something that can't retaliate while you dump all of your PP so you can begin this process. On the first route, there's a 5% chance to encounter an opposing Hopup, and we already know that it can attack, but this is where we're first going to begin our path on being the very best, but guys, it's never that easy. Because you see, Generation 2 implemented a wonderful change from Generation 1, and that's the fact that enemy Pokemon actually use power points against you. While the change is fantastic and it opens up some new strategies, it's not a good one for us here. A hop-up that's less than level 5 will only have Splash, and that means it only has 40 turns before it's going to start using Struggle. Us being at level 5 means that we'll be left with about 35 power points worth of moves, and the enemy hop is going to start struggling and it's going to take us out. You do start off with 3,000 Pokemon dollars and I just went ahead and I spent it all on potions at the Pokemart. When I got done with this you really didn't need 10 but I didn't want to chance it at the time. After that you need to hit the 5% chance to find a second hop up so that you can get rid of the rest of your power points and that's when the fun can begin. Let the struggle strategies commence and we can work towards basically being able to start the game. From there it's pretty straightforward. You can battle whatever wild encounters now and you can use struggle. The experience is very slow but the goal here is to reach level 10 and when we do that, what's our grand prize? It's tackle! I can now figuratively and literally tackle the game and Hop Up's problems are pretty much over guys, it's going to be smooth sailing from here on out. Huh. After going to Professor Oak and then being called back by Professor M, it's time for the first rival battle. This one's pretty easy considering that we went through everything to get to this point. The massive level advantage alone is enough just to swiftly get through this one in our way. I appropriately name our rival Cuck, and now we can officially get into progressing through the game. After some backtracking, I arrive in Violent City, I immediately make my way to the Flying Gym, and the very first Bird Keeper in his level 9 Sparrow dominates me, and that makes me rethink my decisions. 
The better option is to go ahead and take on Sprout Tower. The battles in the experience are easy enough, and overall it gets us 4 additional levels and some new moves, and hopefully that's what we need just to survive the super effective flying damage at the gym. I return and this time I'm able to get past the level 9 Sparrow, but it's honestly not great. I did only spam tackle, I have some status moves, I have a heal, maybe it's not going to be too bad right? And that brings us to Faulkner. And his lead is a level 7 Pidgey, it's a pretty weak Pokemon and overall tackle alone is more than sufficient to get past it. It's not a problem, it barely hurts us back, but now let's take a look at the Pidgeotto. I have Poison and Paralysis along with a heal, so technically it's possible, but Gus just does so much damage that I can't outheal the incoming damage or get any Poison set up. I was hoping it would lose a turn while being paralyzed, but I get outpaced and I lose my first attempt. The second attempt, I miss Poison Powder, I immediately get Crit, and I stay in the battle, but it's pretty much already decided at that point and there's really nothing I can do to stop the inevitable wide out. I fail another attempt and then I decide to go finish up another level by grinding. I learned sleep powder at level 17 and the idea is simple. No gust damage if birds sleeping. Remember that guys, it's important. With our groundbreaking new strategy, I dive back in. Turn 1, miss. Then I get hit with a gust. Turn 2, miss. I get hit with a gust. Turn 3, oh the sleep connects. Turn 4, I go for poison powder. Miss. Turn 4, obviously the Pidgeotto is just going to wake up and immediately gust us. And I'm at 9 HP and this is making me upset. Thankfully, the next sleep connects and I synthesize to get my HP up and I manage to keep it to sleep when it wakes back up. I eventually swap over to tackle and I just beat it down and that's the first batch down. Easy. From there, the path to Azalea Town is simple since I'm over leveled and let's pick up there. It's no surprise that this is my favorite Pokemon town since Slowpoke is my favorite Pokemon. And the first order of business is to smack Team Rocket since they want to take our little baby's tails. But this is a glimpse into one of Hopup's main problems. Poison types are difficult and they are going to be plentiful in the run. I'm able to barely survive, but just remember this going forward. And this brings us to the second gym. Bugsy has a Kakuna and a Metapod on his team and I'm not sure what compelling commentary you really want from me, but you aren't going to get it. They go down painlessly and that brings us to the Scyther. It's honestly not that bad, but I'd be lying if I said that Fury Cutter damage wasn't ramping up and it didn't start to worry me a little bit. I do put it to sleep just to be safe and the Leech Seed regen chips away at it while I slowly get the win. And these are just the top level hop up strategies that you'll come to love in the run. Immediately after we have a rival fight, remember when I just talked about poison types? Well, ghost poison type specifically almost completely wall hop up. It's the worst case scenario and I'm not looking forward to the fourth gym. My only play here is to leech seed and put it to sleep while it slowly dies and that's all I can do. It's not great, but it slowly gets the job done. Next up is Quilava and fire's bad for hop up as well. Honestly, Honestly, there are tons of things bad for Hoppup, but that's neither here nor there right now. Sleep is quickly going to become a staple of our success in the run. At least I can hit fire types with tackle. I do some damage control and then I move on. Last up is Zubat, and although it's poison and flying, two types that are super effective against us and resist grass, it's Zubat. I mean, come on. It's one of the weakest, and honestly, I can't wait for the Zubat run coming up in the next month or so. It's going to be fun. And that's a rival fight down. We can move on. After chasing a far fetched around, I pick up the headbutt TM. It's a huge upgrade over tackle and is essentially this generation's body slam, albeit a weaker version. I make my way to Goldenrod and after some minor errands, it's time for the gym. Whitney leads with a Clefairy and it's not too much of a hassle. Headbutt is more than enough to deal with it, but that's not what she's infamous for. The mill tank comes in and although I do my best, hop ups part flying typing means that rock moves are super effective and if rollout gets going, I'm done for. It actually crits on the second one and it's just over that fast. The second time I do manage to get it done. If I put it to sleep, I can easily win. That's going to go for a lot of battles. I take decent damage, but notice how I'm able to stabilize with my multiple healing moves before landing the finishing blows. I rag on Hop It for being bad, but honestly it's very similar to the Bell Sprout run I did earlier and what strategies that you use. And that's three badges down, and I'm dreading what's to come. I steal a sparrow from a naive guard, I pick up Quick Claw in the National Park, and then I squirt some water on a pseudo Wudo as I make my way to Ecrotech City. Once there I battle the Kimono Girls, I pick up Surf, and next up is another rival battle in the Burnt Tower. And this town in general is going to be a nightmare for Hop Up, but here's our first taste when he leads off with a Haunter. Like the last time, my only real play here is to Leech Seed and hope that I can keep it asleep long enough to do enough damage. At level 30, 
I did learn Mega Drain, and although it can hit ghost types, the ghastly line's half poison typing means that it's going to resist it. The absolute worst case scenario is that things don't go exactly right for me, and I get cursed, and that's exactly what happens. Cursed does a massive amount of damage, we'll talk about it more later, and if you get hit during the first part of the battle, it makes things pretty much impossible. Couple that with the fact that Quilava is the next Pokemon, and you have a pretty sound defeat on the first attempt. I lose the second time, but on the third time you get to see what happens when you get a little luck and things play in your favor. I get good RNG on the sleep and the turns that Haunter actually gets, it uses moves like Lick and Mean Look. Mega Drain is pathetic in damage, but when you are racing the clock, you need every little bit you can get and I do get past this one avoiding the curse. On the Quilava, you know how it's going to be. Hop up success in tough battles is always going to depend on sleep and some Leech Seed chip damage with some other damaging moves in there to supplement the fight while we stay as safe as possible. It's not great, but a victory is a victory. And wouldn't you know that the rest of his team is also comprised of two other Pokemon that also resist Hop-Up. Magnemite Steel Typing means that Mega Drain and Headbutt do way less damage, but the strategy is generally the same, and Zubat does close out this battle, but we've already talked about it a little bit. For the longest time already in this video, if you've seen one Hop-Up battle, you've almost seen them all. After running in with the Legendary Dogs, and you've seen Simping over Suicune, I'm now able to finally challenge the gym. Morty is a ghost poison type trainer, the very typing that Hop-Up struggles with the most. This isn't going to be great, but I feel like I've already kind of talked about the strategy and what needs to happen with the Haunter in the last rival fight, but this fight is that times five. The first attempt I get hit with Curse on the very first Ghastly, and I've already talked about how bad Curse is, but let's go a little deeper. Curse does a massive quarter of your max health each turn, and there's no way to overcome it since our only way to deal damage is to very slowly chip away at each of his four Pokemon that are immune to tackle. The next attempt is an example of how, even at level 34, I can meticulously weave through the fight, get lucky, avoid Curse from the first two initial Pokemon, get everything to go my way that I want, but by the time Morty's ace Gengar comes in, there's absolutely nothing I can do if it decides it wants to put me to sleep and nuke me down with Dream Eater, since it does outspeed me despite me having a 10 level advantage over it at this stage in the game. And I'm not going to sugarcoat it guys, this is a low point in the run, and that's saying something since it really hasn't been exactly smooth up to this point. I fell many more times until I decide it's time to go grind. You aren't necessarily walled off here, there are lots of trainers to battle on the following routes, so it's not really as tedious as it could be, but that's exactly what I'm going to do here. I exhaust all the extra trainers and that gets me to nearly level 37 and I decide that I'm going to give Morty some more shots. I fail two more times but I'm able to get past on the third turn. It's an extremely boring fight to watch and you guys have seen every trick in the hop up bag up to this point. A brief recap is that Curse is bad and the first two Pokemon solely exist just to put it on me and since that does so much damage it makes the fight nearly impossible. My only way to combat it is to land Sleep Powder on turn one and the only offense I have is Leech Seed procs along with very limited uses of Mega Drain. On the Gengar, dare I say that Hop Up is impressive and resilient here. You do outspeed it at level 37, but I miss my Sleep Powder, of course. Its Hypnosis connects and I have to eat two Dream Eaters, which gets me pretty low and pretty much looks like the fight's over. Hop Up is able to wake up, get the Sleep Powder to connect, Leech Life, and then do resisted Mega Drains and it just allows me to stabilize. I slowly build back up my health from there and and just I chip away at it and I take it out. And everyone in the comments tell Hop Up good job. From there, we know how the matchups go. It's just a Haunter left. It doesn't have Curse. The goal here is to put it to sleep. Leech Seed procs, etc, etc. You know the drill by this point. I'm able to perform masterfully here. And this just might be the hardest fight in the entire game considering how early it is. And I'm very glad that this one's over with. The next route is already cleared from grinding. And there's not much to do in Olivine at the current moment besides battle trainers inside of the lighthouse. After a brisk swim down to Sinewood, brother, it's almost already time for another badge. Can you believe it? North of the island, I have another run in with Suicune, and out of nowhere, Mega Simp you've seen shows up and he wants to battle. The battle itself isn't that interesting. On runs where you have an early roadblock where you have to grind to get past, later fights will always just be inherently easy due to the levels required to get past that hurdle. In this case, I'm a level 40 fighting low level 20 Pokemon. You've seen Dust have a Haunter. But honestly, it's not that special. Everybody has a Haunter, dude. And you know the strategy by now, but the rest of the Pokemon just get headbutted as we move towards the gym. Inside the gym, I actually forget strength, and I'm going to keep it 100 here. I forgot where to get strength. 
After using some Pokey Google, I do pick it up all the way back in Olivine and I have to surf back towards Cyanwood, but it's a short trip, it's not a big deal. I can finally face Chuck now, and you'd think that Hoppup might actually have a decent matchup here since flying resists fighting, and you'd be right. It's a nice change of pace from some of the things that we've already been through, and honestly it's a fairly easy fight. The Primate doesn't even need Sleep Powder to get past it, and that's good considering that we've hard relied on this move a lot. Polyrath has Hypnosis, and I didn't plan on taking a hit of the old sleep powder, but I got a little anxious here and I put it to sleep just to be safe. I don't want to get put to sleep and have some crazy stuff happen. It's half water typing also means that Mega Drain does exceptional damage here. And just like that, it's five badges down and perhaps things are looking up. I bring Ampharos its medicine and now that means I can take on Jasmine. She's one of the toughest gems in the game and I did learn on previous playthroughs that you can and it's probably even designed for you to skip over her, go battle price, and then return later. But I'm a curious cat and I wanted to see if maybe I could just go ahead and get it done. I'm not going to mince words here, Jasmine is tough. Steel types aren't necessarily as bad as ghost types, but they still resist all of our damaging moves. Electric is neutral to hop up and I'm worried about Thunder Wave, so I use Sleep Powder to offset that on the first Magnemite because I know it wants to go for it. It takes a little bit, but overall I'm able to sustain my health, I get it down with minimal trouble. Like a lot of the gym leaders in the game, she does go ahead and just bring out the big boy A Steelix second in response. Response. At first thinking that the ground typing making grass neutral wouldn't make it too bad, but Steelix is level 35 and it's an absolute tank. Iron Tail also does insane amount of damage and if it gets a defense drop from it, it can almost 100 to 0 me very quickly. I keep it asleep the best that I can and I rely on Mega Drain and Leech Seed to slowly chip it down. The fight's made even longer because Jasmine will use a Hyper Potion when it's low and that makes this fight extremely long and I actually get through it on the first attempt and at this point I'm pretty happy I'm thinking that this one's a done deal. But not so fast my friends. The second Magnemite comes in, I miss the Sleep Powder, and then I get paralyzed, and that means that this one is over in a heartbreaker, but I did so well, it shouldn't be too bad to repeat the, the results and improve, right? The next attempt, Magnemite gets a paralysis on me, and I just cannot keep up with Steelix and its Iron Tails after that. The next try, you guessed it, I'm paralyzed, and then some heavy Iron Tails come in, and this one's slowly starting to turn bad. After two more failed attempts, I'm able to avoid paralysis, and with some luck, that makes the Steelix much more manageable, and once again I'm able to get past it, but history repeats itself. I'm at about half health, I miss the Sleep Powder once again, I get paralyzed, and then I get nuked down. I fell several more times and at this point, I'm thinking it's probably smarter just to come back for this one later. But guys, I can see the potential in this spot. I can see the win condition. Honestly, I should have just used the berry that cures paralysis and that would have made things much more consistent. But eventually, like with all my runs, I'm persistent and I'm able to persevere. Avoiding paralysis on the first Magnemite, weaving your way through the Steelix fight, and being at high health on the last Magnemite was exactly what you need. At this point, if I really needed to, I could tank some damage, but this time I actually hit the Sleep Powder first, and the usual go-to strategy is in effect for this one. It's just a typical Hoppic battle, Leech Seed, some chip damage here and there, slow, steady, it was tough, and it definitely required things to go well for you because adversity is not something that Hop Up handles very well. That's yet another gym down, and we're cruising at this point. The next order of business is to seek out the shiny Gyarados and eliminate it because there can only be one shiny in this run, and it's me. Afterwards, Lance just uses a goddamn hyper beam on a person, like he kills somebody pretty much. And in this section of the game, I'm not gonna be overly negative. But this is the worst part in the game to me. Johto is often criticized for its level curve, and this is where it's at its worst. Look at the overall levels compared to mine, and it's just going to be battle after battle against Team Rocket for two whole segments with level 20 Pokemon, with a gem sprinkled in between that. That's about as much as I'm really going to talk about this segment, because I'm feeling positive today, and instead, I'll just skip over the majority of it. I'm doing all the battles I can just because I'm always worried about Hop-Up, but the gym 
twist is that I get two passwords so that I can get another password. I fight an executive. I murder some electros. And that's this little piece done just like that. Nice and neat. This takes us to the seventh gym. And Hop Up has lots of weaknesses, but nothing's worse than ice. Grass and flying is double weak to it. And I'm obviously saying that because this is the ice gym coming up. We dive into the first attempt and I don't do great. Seal is first. I miss the initial sleep powder and I take an icy wind in response. Honestly, it's not that bad and I'm able to recover to get past this one. Dugong is next and this is where the first attempt ends. I miss every single one of my sleep powder attempts and a couple of aurora beams are enough to force a reset. The next attempt, I'm able to avoid all bad luck on all of my sleep powders from the first two Pokemon and then Piloswine is the ace of the team and I have a huge loss condition here. If I miss sleep powder and then it hits a blizzard, I'm just done for it, even if I'm at full health. It's also worth noting that Blizzard received a well-deserved nerf in Generation 2, going from 90% accuracy in Gen 1 down to 70%. And while this battle might seem like it's awful, there's a silver lining here. It's that each of his three Pokemon's second typing are all weak to grass, and if I can hit one sleep, it's over with. I do fail a couple of more times because I just couldn't hit a sleep powder on the Piloswine to save my life. Eventually, the RNG does go my way and I'm able to quickly knock down his Pokemon with Mega Drain after I give them a little nappy, and it's just a win-win situation for everyone involved. This one took about five tries in total and as far as struggles go, this one's not too bad. Now it's time to pick up return. As far as offensive moves go, most people would probably say this is the strongest in Gen 2, if not just outright broken. It's a normal move that scales with your friendship level and it caps at an amazing 102 base power. I don't learn it immediately, but it is a boost to our damage and it's worth talking about now since it's going to be relevant for the rest of the run. Next, it's that time for another segment that I'm not a huge fan of. Team Rocket has taken over Goldenrod Tower and it's at least slightly better than the previous hideout segment and generally the last huge time sink of the run. This part of the game is beyond tedious and most of that is mainly due to the prevalence of poison types that Team Rocket loved to use. On a positive note, I can say that there's at least battles that I can actually lose, but since we are playing Hop It, it's not really that crazy to think about. Specifically, the imposter director fight is very annoying. It's not quite Morty levels of all but Poison can still add up and make the fight extremely annoying. He has about 32 coughings and a wheezing and at this stage in the video you guys know the strategy to get past these fights. And you might be saying, Matt, well, why don't you just learn Return yet? And the answer is because I wanted to see how long I could go before I absolutely needed it. This fight, although annoying, wasn't really that bad. I have two failures and that's it. I just really wanted to have an elaborate part of the video where I complain about how annoying two back-to-back -back Team Rocket segments are with about a thousand poison type Pokemon really was. There's also a rival battle in the middle of all the rocket shenanigans. There's no need to fully dive into this one. The team is roughly the same, but the order is different. Golbat is the lead this time, and in general there's no real favorable matchups for me throughout the fight. It's a bit of a slog, but it's still a one shot. Having the Haunter come in basically at the end of the battle helps out a lot because there's no real threat of curse, because the longer the battle, the worse it is. We've been over that quite a lot. The new addition to the team is Sneasel. It's an ice Pokemon, but luckily for us, Sneasel is pretty awful. After sliding on some ice, it's now time for the final gem of the game. This was also the point where I decided there's no more reason to hold off on return. It's stronger, it has more power points, and it's just an improvement over Headbutt in every single way. As for Claire, the first attempt doesn't go great. Thunder Wave from the first Dragonair puts us in a position to be hobbled the rest of the fight. Then I get it down, and obviously the second Dragonair is going to have Ice Beam, and that just puts us in an awful spot, and that's it. On the second attempt, I avoid Thunder Wave from the first one, and that allows me to be faster and actually be able to handle the second Ice Beam having Dragonair so that I don't have to take that awful double super effective damage. The third Dragonair actually does paralyze me once again and I get really low, but we know Hop Up can be resilient if it gets a sleep off and gets some healing going. I take the fight really quick, but it's probably worth mentioning that Shiny Hop Up's hidden power is actually Dragon type. And if things were getting desperate, I guess I could have gone for that option, but two tries is really good so there's no need. Claire doesn't give you the badge and forces you to go to the dragon's den to prove your worth. And I would just like to say that I like Claire's character a lot. She's the younger cousin of Lance. She's brash. She's overconfident and not quite as good as she actually thinks she is. She doesn't want to accept defeat and forces you to do something that she can't even do yet. Coming from Generation 1, 
one, having gym leaders be a lot more than just static sprites with zero personality is pretty great, and I appreciate that Generation 2 did this with several of them. Now let's get all that positivity out guys, uh, the, the channel vibes are just through the charts today. With 8 badges down, I head towards Victory Road. It's the shortest Victory Road in all of the Pokemon games, and there's one last rival battle at the end of it. It's very similar to the last one. He's changed the order once again, but just like previous fights, it goes in our favor because the Haunter is near the end, and Curse just loses its effectiveness the longer you wait to bring it out. The only change here is that Quillava has evolved into a Typhlosion, but with things like Haunter and Kadabra not being fully evolved, not getting that same treatment, we can just use Return. Our damage is pretty respectable, and when you couple that with the usual Sleep and Leech Seed strategies, I get through this one fairly easy. Also, this is one of the worst examples of the leveling curve of Generation 2. I'm a whopping level 60, and all the trainers battles on the way here against a team of mostly around mid 30 Pokemon, there's just no need to talk about this too much. Now it's time for the Elite Four. I use a couple of PP ups and that's about it. Now let's just dive into it and see how it goes. First up is Wheel, and there's no need to really dive into this one as well. With our level advantage and how powerful Return and Sleep are, this one's a breeze. Fortunately, the two Zatu on the team do not have any flying moves despite being flying typing. The Executor can be annoying, and the Slowbro is extremely weak to our Mega Drain. The only potential pitfall in the fight is Jinx, and missing sleep could be disastrous, but it just doesn't happen. As far as this fight goes, it's not bad, and spoiler alert, we will have to fight Will some later, but I think this one time is enough for everybody to get the gist of how Will's gonna go. It's not that important. Next up is Koga, and this one's pretty rough. Ariados is the lead, and it's not too bad. It wants to use annoying moves, and I guess if you left it unchecked, it would baton pass, but it's never really an issue. But let's talk about the fight in more depth, not specifically this attempt. The problem here is toxic. In terms of annoyance, it's somewhere between regular poison and curse, and realistically you have about three or four turns before you'll be in pretty big danger or just already dead. After Ariados, three of his last four Pokemon have toxic on the team. I fell several times and on a lot of them, it's not even the toxic that does me in. Relying on sleep powder is inconsistent at best, and things like Crobat's wing attack or even Venomoth confusing me into some psychics can just take us down. It's a pretty tough fight, and eventually I have to start just taking the white out and keeping the experience I got from Will and the few Pokemon I can actually beat in the fight. This goes on for quite a while, and you would think it would be easier than Morty since Return can actually hit them, but it's just impossible to stay ahead of Toxic since Mega Drain is just resisted by every single one of his Pokemon. I fell a lot, and I think this actually might be the worst fight in the game now that I'm thinking about it. Sleep Powder has a 75% chance to hit, but having to hit every single Pokemon on multiple times sometimes, and even having to go through some full restores means that you're eventually gonna miss. And even if you make it really far to the end of the fight, the Forestress is an absolute menace. It resists all of my moves, and it has access to protect to stall the battle even further while you are on such a short clock with Toxic. Thankfully, this is only the second fight, so restarting from the beginning is annoying, but it's not like it takes a long time to get back here. Eventually, I'm able to get enough sleep powders to connect, and I make my way to the Forestress while not being poisoned and being healthy. It's the one Pokemon left that doesn't have Toxic, and while it does have some annoying things like Explosion, Leech seed and chipping away at it gets me the victory. This one was very tough and it stretched my hop-up knowledge to its absolute limits. Next up is Bruno and I rag on Bruno every single red and blue video, but remember this is a different game. He is much improved here. I still hate him with every fiber of my being, but as far as the battle goes there's a lot of fighting types and resisting it with our part flying typing is it's pretty great. With that said, there are a few potential pitfalls. First, Hitmonchan has Ice Punch, but it's pretty awful. It's a special move and since the special split isn't a thing yet, Hitmonchan just has awful special attack. The second is Onyx has access to a stabbed Rock Slide, and the third is that Machamp also has access to Rock Slide. On our first attempt, it's going great, and I kind of mess up at the end. Machamp wakes up, I try to put it back to sleep instead of just nuking it down, and I think I would have outpaced it and got the win, but I miss, and it just takes the fight. This means I have to do Koga again, but I'll spare you the footage. On the second attempt, it's not looking great when I make it back to the Machamp. Rock Slides get me all the way down to 15 HP, but I'm able to take it out. I hit the sleep powder on the Hitmonlee, and I'm able to stabilize and slowly chip away to finally get a win. This one wasn't too bad, but it seems pretty volatile with some of his Pokemon's coverage moves. Bruno is 
I'll get he's much improved, I'll say that, but he still needs some work in my opinion. Karen is up next, and just like a true Karen, her team is set up in such a way to be annoying, similar to Koga. Their sand attack, confuse ray, stun spore, spot, curse, destiny bond, there's pursuit to catch you if you're playing an actual run and need to switch, and there's other things. With that said, I don't have any trouble in this fight. The main thing I want to do is to avoid the sand attacks from Umbreon, and I do that. After I take it down, she brings in the big guns with Houndoom to try to get off a flamethrower, but I got a level advantage, and I don't even think it could one hit me even if it got it off. Sleep is the name of the game like always, and I just zoom through the fight. The funny thing about this one is that she has a Gengar that actually gets off a curse, but just like with the last couple of rival fights, it brings it in way too late and I can actually outpace the rest of the fight. And I take a first try victory here, and now Hop Up is really feeling it guys. Lance is the champion this time, and let's just dive in. He leads with Gyarados, I outspeed, I hit with a return, and then it goes for a rain dance. A second return moves us on. Next up is the first of Lance's 8 18 Dragonites. I put it to sleep because one of them has Blizzard, the other one has Fire Blast, you really can't tell what's what. Two returns don't do it, so I have to sprinkle in a Leech Seed to actually get this one done. It wasn't that bad, and hopefully we can just keep up this positive RNG with Sleep Powder. Aerodactyl is up next. It outspeeds, which could be problematic. Rock Slide does a significant amount of damage to start us off, but once again, Sleep doesn't fail, and from here I'm able to take advantage of it being neutral to grass, and I finish off the fight not quite at full health but pretty close. Now it's time for Charizard, and this could be tough. I missed the Sleep Powder, and I have to take the full brunt of a Flamethrower, but Hop Up survives at 26 health, and there's still a chance, guys. I get the Sleep to connect, and I don't want to risk Leech Seeding it since it's very dangerous to play with this Pokemon, but two returns do get us past, but I'm not out of the woods yet. I'm very low and there's two pseudo legendaries left. The second Dragonite comes in and I need sleep to hit, and it does. From there, rather than straight nuking it down, I need to get my health up just a little bit for some insurance. Lance starts whipping out the full heals. I connect with another sleep, but the second time he goes for a full heal, there's no need to put it back to sleep. A return is enough to take it out and Leech Life finishes it off and it puts us at a pretty respectable health level. From there, there's one more Dragonite left, guys. I need everyone's energy to make it connect connect, and it does. Lance has exhausted his supply of full heals, and after a leech seed for a tiny bit of chip damage, two returns is enough to take it out. And that's it guys, Hop Up is the champion of Johto, and it has beaten the game. And I can't say I'm really impressed, but I can honestly say thank god for Sleep Powder and the fact that everything in the entire game can learn return, or I'm not quite sure I would have made it through. But I'm sure everyone wants to know Hop Up's final time, and well I'm just kidding guys. There's a whole other side of the world to get through, and I promised you guys red, and we are going to get through it. Now I'm not going to go over every single segment of the Kanto side, because honestly, I'm very over leveled, and it's kind of designed just to be a nice throwback to fans, and it's not meant to even be a higher challenge than the Elite Four, and I'm fine with that. Instead, I thought I would just go over some of the differences and things that I either like or find interesting in the three years that have passed from Generation 1 taking place up to the events of Generation 2. Honestly, this part of the game isn't even that long, it's pretty short, and I can't lie to you guys, I actually enjoyed myself quite a bit, so let's just dive in, let's take a look. You start off in Kanto and Vermilion via the SS Aqua, and let's just jump straight into Lieutenant Surge to show an example of how it's going to be. Surge is about average in terms of the 8 gems left, and you've seen enough of my Gen 1 runs to kind of spot the differences here. I like his team overall, but this will just give you a great example as to why I'm not going to show every full experience, because just look at the level advantage and look what Return is doing here. I honestly think it's pretty brilliant to drop you off here, which is basically the center of the Kanto map. This means that there's actually a lot of options and ways that you can tackle the game, and you can do a lot of the content in whatever way you choose, and I think that's pretty fantastic. It's almost like I'm going on tour of my hometown after being away for years, and that's a pretty good feeling. Sabrina is the second gem I come across, and everything being roughly the same level means that it doesn't really matter where you go, and although the leveling curve is often criticized, I don't mind it here, because you've already beat the game at this point, and this is just kind of like your reward, and in a normal playthrough, this is kind of your chance to find new Pokemon, and having most of this content be around level 30 and 40 kind of allows you to experiment 
and train new Pokemon. I don't mind it. Now let's get into some important upgrades to our Hoppy Boy. Celadon contains everything that we're going to need and the first order of business is leftovers. And I would say this held item is probably a lot of people's favorite one. And it just simply restores health each turn passively. That along with Leech Life gives us a lot of regen and it helps towards our ultimate goal. Erica's up next and I'm going to be a broken record at this point. But you know what our nice level 69 hop up's going to do with return since it loves us so much. I really like the gym leader's enhanced teams. That's neither here nor there. The important thing here that turns out to not really be that important is that you get Giga Drain. It functions just like Mega Drain except that it's 50% stronger and it has a little less PP to deal with but that's fine. Celadon also has Protect in the huge Pokemart but I end up not using it this run but it is there. Let's get into some parts of the game that I really liked. Janine is Koga's daughter and the gimmick for the gym is that everyone is disguised as her for some trickery. I actually fought and defeated her and I didn't even realize that it was the gym leader until she gave me the badge. Her team is specifically weak and her Pokemon go as low as level 33 but I don't really think this is a negative. I kind of interpret this as perhaps she's a new gym leader. She's thrust into this role because Koga got promoted to the Elite Four and I think it's pretty neat. I actually like the idea. I also really like that Lavender Town has modernized and now the infamous Pokemon Tower has been converted into a radio tower now. There is a little side quest involving finding the parts to fix the power plant, but that's not that important. We're not going to go over that. Rock Tunnel is a bit of a bruh moment for me. Flash is much darker than in Gen 1, and I know Rock Tunnel like the back of my hand. In Gen 2, you can pause, you can visit the item menu, and it'll briefly let you see the area. And I thought I was kind of gaming the system here. I wanted to prove that I could do it just because I knew it so well, and it took me forever to realize that the layout is actually different, and I actually just have Flash. I spent an embarrassing amount of time just bumping into walls before I dusted off the old Paris uh, to light things up for me. When you revisit Pallet Town, it's revealed that Blue took Giovanni's place, but visiting Red's house and having his mom reveal that he's been gone a while, and when you go into the room and check your old PC from the first game, and it's saying that it hasn't been used in a long time, honestly gives me some chills. I know it kind of sounds like a dweeb thing to say, but it is what it is. I really like the next couple of parts. First, you run into Blue at what's supposed to be Cinnabar. He explains that the volcano erupted and essentially wiped out the town before leaving you to await your challenge in Vermilion. The sign here says that Blaine has relocated to the Seafoam Island since his gym was destroyed. And once there, Blaine is just kind of holed up in the tiniest little cave and I like that detail a lot. He is the fire gym and obviously I'm going to fail at least one attempt here. But overall it takes me two times and I get through it but that's not really that interesting. You know he's going to have the Rapidash. He has a Macargo. He has an interesting team but let's just talk about this part. The hilarious part to me is the guy that usually says yo champ in the making you know that guy he only shows up after you defeat Blaine because he couldn't find the gym I actually walked out of here and I had to do a double take and backtrack because he wasn't there before and I was like wait a second and it's a really good moment it's actually very small but it's one of my favorite parts about the Kanto section now we've had a lot of nostalgia and I had a good time but enough is enough let's get down to brass tacks and let's look at one of the tougher battles in the game with the last gym against a familiar rival that we fought many times over his team is a mixture of all the combinations from Gen 1, but without the starters if that makes sense. He leads with Pidgeot, and while it can do some damage to us, Return does massive damage, and with leftovers I can actually get through it and get back enough health to be in a decent position. But from there, Blue's not messing around. It's time for that triple thick with three C's Arcanine. I hit the sleep powder on turn one, and you might think that this one's done for, but Blue is actually packing some full restores. I get hit hard, and then I make a mistake. I put it back to sleep, and then I'm just trying to go for some leech seeds along with leftovers and try to get my health back up, but it's just a little bit too slow, and that ends up being our downfall. I go down, that's the first attempt, that's the first reset. Attempt two, I miss sleep powder, and then I get hit with a flamethrower, and then it goes for a priority move in extreme speed to finish off the battle in style, and I kind of hope that this is not a precursor to fire tops later in the run. On the third attempt, I'm about half health, and I'm just in a worse position overall. I get off sleep and leech seed before 
before it gets to full restore. And luckily, the second sleep connects, and my health regen is pretty excellent at this point. With returns, I'm able to start doing some decent damage, and I do get past this nightmare, but there's plenty of Pokemon left. Alakazam is the next Pokemon. It's defensively frail. It does manage to get off some minor damage, but I'm able to return my way to victory easily after dealing with the Arcanine. Rhydon comes in, it's fourth, and it's double weak to Giga Drain, and that's really all you need to know. Now it's Gyarados' time. It only has Hyper Beam that we have to worry about. It has no flying moves. I do miss the initial Sleep Powder, but it only goes for Rain Dance, and that's pretty much the end of the fight. That seals its fate. Sleep connects, and that's all it takes to move on to the end of the fight. Now we're looking at Executor, and this one's basically a done deal. I'm immune or just pretty much resist everything that it has, but I still opt to play it safe. Sleep into some returns take this fight at full health, and three tries isn't too bad, but that's actually the 16th badge down, guys. But I know that no one cares about any of that. There wasn't ever a question if I could get these badges with such a massive level advantage, and I know you guys want to see one thing. There's only one challenge left, so why don't we just dive into red and, and see what awaits us there. I begin my tries at level 76, and first up is a level 81 Pikachu. There are several things that make this awful. The first is that it outspeeds me. It's not too surprising. But that means we'll take a move, and honestly, Thunder is probably the best thing you can see here, although you don't want to get a Paralysis proc on you. It does heavy damage, I miss my Sleep Powder, then a second Thunder paralyzes me, but I do get the Sleep to connect on the following turn. Red does have full restore, so it's pretty much done shortly after that. From there, it's clear that I'm not even close for this fight at this stage, and let's just see what we can kind of learn. On the second attempt, we see Charm. Charm harshly lowers my attack, and that's just not going to work for me. It gimps return, which is our main source of damage, and in the second attempt, I'm actually able to just straight up crit on return and take it down. But guys, there's a level 77 Charizard that's faster than us, and I go down in about 0.5 seconds to a flamethrower, but progress is progress. I try again, and I make it past the Pikachu, but I do get paralyzed, and that's just not going to bode well on the Charizard. You know what's going to happen. You don't, you know, just watch. At this point, I have to start grinding some levels so we can start seeing how much it's going to take. I battled the Elite Four until I get to where I want to do a couple of retries, and now we're going to jump into some level 80 attempts. I still don't outspeed the Pikachu, but it does miss a Thunder, and then I get another crit on return, and we can actually see what happens when we go into the Charizard at full health. And the question here, a very important question, can Hop Up survive a flamethrower if we are at full health? The answer is no, I get absolutely obliterated. So we're going to need more levels. I keep trying, I keep grinding. In. I weave in some tries between, we're going to cut those out, but let's pick up at level 85. And the first great thing to notice is that now I can actually outspeed the Pikachu. That's wonderful. I do miss the initial sleep powder, and I just get hit with a charm, which is basically the worst case scenario. I put it to sleep from there, I get a leech seed, red has full restores, and from there it misses a couple of thunders, but I get him to exhaust all of his full restores here. Eventually the thunders do start connect, and I have a charm lowering my attack along with the paralysis. It just means I should reset. There are some positives coming from this, but this specifically was not a good attempt. I can't stress how many times I try this fight, and how long grinding takes at these late levels, but finally, I get a turn one sleep on Pikachu. Red cures the sleep, but the sad part is that return is just off of a one shot. We posture around for a bit, and sleep powders, leech seeds, full restores, and eventually a lethal return does get us through at full health, and we have no charm or paralysis on us. This is the best case scenario going into Charizard, but it still outspeeds us, and Flamethrower is still a one shot at level 85. Charizard is becoming an absolute wall, I don't know what we're really going to do about it. So I'm going to spare you guys a lot of failures here, and we're going to pick right back up at level 88 to see how things change. And there are two things that we really want to see, and the first one is if Return can actually just one and done the Pikachu consistently, and sadly it's not a one shot. It might have been a range, but it's just off. I'm able to avoid anything bad, I manipulate out the full restores, and eventually Return along with some tiny leech seed chip damage is enough to get 
get through unscathed. Now to answer our next question. Do we outspeed? And does Flamethrower obliterate us from Charizard? The answer is no, I don't outspeed. And Flamethrower just crits us, so no one knows. Who cares? Eventually I get a crit on the initial return on Pikachu. And after some failed attempts, now we can hopefully see where we stand on Charizard. And <laughs> what do you know it? Flamethrower just crits again. And I cannot stress enough how many times I've died on this fight. How much time I've spent already. And I'm not even close to breaking through on this one. I fail even more attempts and I level up one more time. I'm still failing and return is not always a one shot. Sometimes it is, sometimes it's not. During this level 89 attempt, I get it down quick and painlessly and now we just need to focus on this huge Charizard roadblock. And finally guys, I'm pleased to announce that at this level, I can finally survive a flamethrower. I'm very low, but at least we might be able to make some progress. Now it's really an uphill battle. I need sleep to connect. It does. Now I need to leech seed along with leftovers. I need to start getting back some health and then I need to start going for returns. And finally, after countless attempts that started way back then at level 76, I'm able to get it down and we finally get to see the next Pokemon. Hopup has broken the wall. Then Espeon just comes in and I miss two sleep powders and two psychics just quickly take me out. I do like the progress, but this is, it's not enough. And that's pretty much reset number 8,000. I fell about 37 more times and just the fact of the matter is that level 89 still wasn't consistent on Pikachu and I cave in I level up one more time to level 90. I need just the tiniest bits of stats to make it a guaranteed one shot and sadly I'm pulling my hair out it's still not a one shot and that's pretty infuriating. It seems like no matter how much I level up it's always off by a little bit. I'm forced to use the old strategy. I use sleep to get rid of the full restores, do some tiny leech seed chip damage and then I'm able to finish it off with the return. We've seen this before, it's nothing new. But then something miraculous happens at level 90. This is where Hopup outspeeds the Charizard. So now it's not a matter of just surviving the flamethrower, it's a matter if we can just get the sleep off first and we can just avoid it entirely. Red is out of full restores at this point and I hit the sleep. I do a leech seed because if it wakes up I can survive the flamethrower and I might need those extra heals. Then I just crit it with return and we're through the raid boss at full health. Now we get our second look at Espeon. It outspeeds me. It sets up a reflect. I set up sleep and leech seed and the joke's on red because Hopup's always been a struggle this whole run. I don't care if Return is doing less damage with reflect. It doesn't bother me at all. I get fortunate that it stays asleep and now I'm not getting too excited yet because we are treading on new ground. And next up is our first look at Snorlax. I put it to sleep and then I go for leech seed. It's the usual strategy. It does have snore. And what's funny is that Leech Seed combined with Leftovers actually completely negates the damage entirely. This is a pretty long encounter as far as battle goes. It does wake up, it gets off an Amnesia, then I put it back to sleep, I get it really low, and right before I can finish it off, it gets off a rest. Although it does snore some more, and it actually gets off a critical hit on snore, it just can't outpace the returns. I'm pretty sure Reflect was still active and eventually wore off at some point during the fight, and that probably helped out too, but this one is isn't over yet guys. Now we got a Venusaur. Grass types are immune to leech seed so there goes one leg of our tried and true strategy but the positive thing is that it really can't hurt as much. I miss the initial sleep but it goes for sunny day. Who cares? The next sleep doesn't miss and since I can't leech seed it's just gonna be returned for days and I have no fear of it retaliating back on me really. Sleep may have not been needed here but Venusaur is tanky. I didn't want to take any chances. Overall it takes three returns to get it down and at this point I'm thinking maybe I got a shot to make it through this battle. And last up is Blastoise. Not so fast my friends. Initially it looks like Red maybe burned through the best counters but just don't celebrate yet. Blastoise has access to Blizzard and that's a very scary move to take. We've seen what it could do on the prize fight earlier and I had a huge level advantage then. Sleep Powder is absolutely crucial here and we connect once again. I go for a Leech Seed but looking back I probably should have just started doing Giga Drains rather than the seed because I'm not surviving a blizzard either way. Let's be real. I have a really scary moment halfway through the fight when it wakes up, goes for a blizzard, but thank god it misses. I was fully clinched during that moment, I can't lie, but I wrestle back control and after a giga drain, I finish off the fight and hop up has done the impossible. And what a fight, honestly. I've never had to retry a fight than this and put more time into leveling up more than what I did today, but I had a good time. So what it's all about, really. 
really. The red fight was definitely front loaded, but once we really broke through that wall and got to his back line, we won the first try. And it feels good, and there's really not a whole lot to say about Hopup. It's very weak, its learn set's bad, its stats are bad, it relies on sleep powder way too much, more than any Pokemon I've ever seen. In a lot of ways, it's kind of like Bellsprout, in the fact that in key fights, if you miss sleep powder, you're just done for. But it's more like the Wish version of Bellsprout, if I'm being honest, and the flying subtyping just gives it a ton more weaknesses without really giving it any other advantages outside of resisting fighting, I guess. But it's been fun, and if any of you guys play Pokemon Go, remember that this weekend is actually the community day, so get those free shiny hop-ups, they're absolutely free. And I hope you enjoyed me uh, getting back around to a different game, Pokemon Crystal, new experience for me, and I apologize for the length, I know it's going to be a long one. In fact, analytics tell me that most people barely make it past 10 minutes, so realistically, who am I even talking to right now? But that's going to do it for me, guys. I hope you have a great day, and if you made it this far, I appreciate you, and I'll catch you guys on the next video. Bye!